exciting. This is a wonderful opportunity. Hi, I'm Angela Brindlinger. I'm the um, director of the Center for Slavic and East European Studies here at Ohio State. Some of you know me, most of you don't, but come to our events. We have lots of events all the time, including about 100 events this week, I think. Um, this is one of a, one that we've been waiting for and excited about. This is the, the graduate, so-called graduate student um, lecture for the autumn semester. Um, we like to highlight not just our guests and not just uh, even our own students, but um, students even from outside of our program. So we're super excited uh, to be able to introduce you to Boot, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Classics here at Ohio State University. I have just met her myself, but I'm very pleased and I'm excited for this lecture. Um, before moving to Columbus, uh, she lives in Moscow, where she received her BA in Classical Philology at the Russian State University for the Humanities. Um, and she first came to the US as a uh, participant in the Fulbright Foreign Student Program. She rapidly realized that Columbus was a great place to be um, and, uh, and has remained here, um, luckily for us. Uh, her research interests include ancient Greek poetry and literary theory, Hellenistic literature, Greek and Latin epistolography, reception studies, classical reception in Soviet Russia, Greek theater on the modern stage, Roman verse satire, and humor studies. I'm not sure we're going to be laughing as we think about Prometheus I'm, in Russia. I'm, 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 um, mm -hmm. But if she tells us any jokes, we'll be sure to laugh and we'll say hello to her mom in Moscow. We are streaming today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for Center for Slavic and East European Studies to invite me. And thank you for Classics Department to be here and support me. Thank you for my professors, my colleagues, and my students who are here to support me. So let's start. I have a lot of material to cover. And I divided my lecture into three parts. First one, I will talk about who is Prometheus uh, and why talk about him in the context of 20th century Russia. Uh, it might not be very clear from the beginning. Then, I will talk about Prometheus revolutionary in Russia before World War II. Spoiler alert, the story of failures. And then, I will talk about Prometheus in 1960s and 1970s and reinterpretation of his image as superhero. So first, I will start from who is Prometheus. And Prometheus has a lot of a lot of functions and a lot of stories connected with him. So he is Titan of forethought and crafty counsel. He is mo he molded mankind from clay. He created Pandora, the first woman in misfortune for the whole mankind. He tricked the gods and deprived them of the sacrificial meat, uh, making them to accept the insights of animals stole fire from Zeus and gave it to people. He was punished by being mounted to Caucasus. And then Zeus's eagle was eating his ever-regenerating liver. And then eventually he was freed by Heracles. And the image of, of Prometheus was very of big interest of all Greek and Roman Byzantine authors beginning from 8th century BC from Hesiod's poems. But the most prominent work for our topic is Prometheus in Greek tragedy. The one tragedy attributed to Aeschylus, who was canonical Athenian tragedy writer and producer, uh, was a part of um, tragic trilogy, meaning there were three, three tragedies following uh, each other, unwrapping the story of the character. The first one, Prometheus bound, the second Prometheus unbound, and the third, Prometheus fire bearer. So the one tragedy survived, uh, Prometheus bond. And I think it uh, really affected the image of Prometheus uh, throughout the ages and especially in Russia. So we can spend hours and hours and hours talking how the image of Prometheus unwrapped uh, from Greek Roman times to medieval times, Renaissance, uh, early modern and modern times. But I will just refer you to this book which is very accessible, and if you want to learn more about Prometheus, I highly recommend to read this. But I'm really, I'm, uh, um, before starting thinking about Prometheus in Russia, 
uh, I came came upon uh, to uh, information that actually Karl Marx was a very big fan of Prometheus, and for example, even was mocked for this. For example, here is Karl Marx in Promethean image with the eagle eating his liver attached to the printing press. So Karl Marx was very fond of Prometheus. In his dissertation, he wrote about Prometheus that he is first saint and martyr of the philosopher's calendar because he rejects gods and endows humanity with his sacred power. In Marx's economics, uh, Prometheus symbolizes proletariat in its struggle, revolt against capitalism and liberation of humankind. So all these themes and the idea that, uh, that uh, Prometheus symbolizes proletariat and revolution, in my mind, immediately connected with the possibilities how a Promethean image can be interpreted in Soviet Russia and in art performance and um, uh, television of modern Russia. And I started to look into the history of Prometheus in Russian 20th century, and I found out that it starts before the, the revolution. And the first case study I want to talk about is Alexander Scraven's Prometheus, the Poem of Fire. So, um, it was written in um, 1908, 1910, so right before revolution. It premiered in Moscow, in Moscow Conservatory in 1911. It's symphony, but it's not a uh, symphony in a traditional way. It doesn't have four parts, four movements. It has one movement and it combines symphony, uh, piano, concerto, and cantata. Uh, so it has some uh, voice parts. And the most important thing and the most innovative thing about this work that really uh, affected uh, the development of image prom uh, of Prometheus in Russia is that Scrabin invented, together with the music, the part of light that was supposed to be operated by the color organ. So the color instrument that was supposed to project uh, different lights together with the music. So kind of the idea of innovation, light, fire, was there. So uh, it was not based on the tragedy. In the tragedy, we see Prometheus bound to the mountains by the god um, uh, sorry, Hermes, sorry, by the god Hermes and uh, seeing Prometheus uh, talking about what he did, suffering, and then eventually uh, punished by Zeus and falling into abyss. Here, according to program notes written by Scraven student Sabaneev um, uh, for the premiere in Moscow, the performance shows how Prometheus, Satan, and Lucifer struggle against one another before transcending to higher plane of existence. So Prometheus is kind of this mythical, uh, mysterious creature together with Lucifer and apparently Satan. Um, so uh, this work was influenced by uh, Russian philosophy, uh, some the theosophical ideas. The theosophical ideas include the idea that you you acquire the higher knowledge through some mysterious experience. Also, Scraven was influenced by synesthesia, union of all senses. There is a lot of Wagnerian um, influence here. And of course, Scraven was influenced by the tradition and aesthetical program of symbolist theater. For example, Komisarzewski Theater uh, in St. Petersburg uh, that was really into classical myth and classical um, material, and it becomes a meeting place of art, music, dance, and design. So it was premiered in 1911, but the color thing didn't work at all. <laughs> uh, then the second premiere was four years later in New York, and then color thing worked, <laughs> but the but there was a lot of criticism, and one of the critics called it pretty poppy show, mm -hmm. so it kind of looked 
weird apparently. Apparently also there was private performance um, in a smaller place uh, a couple of weeks later and it was better because instead of just projecting lights everywhere they used the tran translucent screen to project on it and apparently it looked um, better but um, I think the failure of this initial uh, performance was was because the musical performance was an uh, invention of light machine were kind of uh, off chronologically and uh, it was not performed very well after this but um, now it's actually performed a lot and uh, different programs and different uh, companies use different types of light machines to express uh, Scriabin's idea. So in St. Petersburg, in Yale, Tokyo, so all over the place. Ten years later, Prometheus was planned to be staged in Moscow Art Theatre. In 1925, in Moscow Art Theatre, two exper experimental uh, studio of the main stage, its director Valentin Smyslarev planned matinee honoring uh, Scrubbin's 10 years of death uh, that was called The Abduction of Fire with music from uh, Scrubbin's Prometheus and some extension. Then, uh, the same year, Vladimir Nemiroj Danchenko, the director of the main stage of Moscow Art Theatre, proposed to produce the whole trilogy and really change the whole concept. Now, the performance uh, was planned to have three parts. So it became much more, uh, um, much bigger. So first part uh, was supposed to be this pantomime, the abduction of fire with Scraven's music. The second part would be the tragedy, Prometheus Bound. And the third part would be Prometheus Unbound, the tragedy that was not uh, preserved, but they, were, but they were planning to, um, to consult classicists uh, that were at the time in Moscow, uh, translate some fragments and adapt uh, a, and ma make a performance from this. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this last part um, became the, com um, the, uh, the most ideological one. Because there, Bond Prometheus, according to the plans, Bound Prometheus becomes the witness of the greatest revolutions, revolt of Spartacus, the Gerson Revolution, and then it was supposed to fin be finished with Russian Revolution of 1917. Smyslaev wanted to interpret the play as being consonant with the revolution. The image of Prometheus here uh, was supposed to become the symbol of liberation, and at the same time, Smyslaev uh, still really wanted to promote the image of Scrabin and talk about his work and present him as a revolutionary artist. So what happened with this uh, performance? March, April 1925, there was initial rehearsal period and Stanislavski was invited to consult. Then in August 1925, this first part, the Scrabin's part was removed because Stanislavski <coughs> was very, very suspicious about all Scrabin's music thing. <laughs> because for, for, for generally of his objection of musical theater um, and other stuff. So during 1926, there were more than 250 rehearsals, but the problem was that Smyslaev was sick and Nemiroj Danchenko went to New York with his troupe um, for, um, for the performances. And eventually, uh, in February 1922, the production was closed. And Stanislavski wrote about it, this one cannot add to classical play anything in the front or from the back. Mm -hmm. I sh uh, it should be presented as it is. And uh, the problem with this play was first of all that it just aesthetically was looking very weird and there was, uh, the, the people who witnessed the dress rehearsal, the, the rehearsal were writing that it was kind of, it, it, was, it looked really silly, there were a lot of people running around in weird costumes. 
this is one thing. The second thing is uh, that they try to achieve many goals. On the one hand, to present revolution and the ideal image of revolutionary, and on the other hand, honor Scrabin and his mystical uh, ideas of Prometheus. So this didn't work. Ten years later, uh, Ukrainian director and sculptor Ivan Kovalyridze uh, produces a movie Prometheus uh, in 1936 um, in the studio of Crying Film. Uh, the film is, in fact, is adaptation of the poem Kafkas, uh, written by Ukrainian poet uh, Shevchenko. It depicts events of 1858 to 1861 during Russian war at Caucasus. Russian Imperial Army was fighting with the Chechen and Dagestani people at this war. But also, the film includes references to Greek tragedy Prometheus Bound and a direct narrative of Promethean myth. So uh, the main characters are Vanya, peasant in serfdom, Pameshik, Squire Svecha, his master, revolutionary Gavrilov, and Katerina, Vanya's fiance. So the story in the film goes that Vanya comes to his master asking for Katerina's hand, and he refuses because he has other plans for her, and he sends him to war, and then at war, Vanya meets revolutionary Gavrilov, who inspires him and teaches him, and Vanya comes back to the, comes back to the village, and then organizes revolution there, and overpowers the Pameshik Svecha. So um, this is uh, the, uh, the canvas of, of the movie, and I wanted to focus on a couple of themes that are really referential, really consonant with the um, Greek tragedy. The first one is that the relationships between um, master and his countrymen are represented as relationships between gods and mortals. For example, when one comes to the master, asking for Katerina's hand, Pameshik Svecha doesn't reply. So there is no communication with the, between them whatsoever, and he just goes up on the stairs uh, to the house in the silent. So this is a very prominent moment, uh, showing this uh, gap between them. But the, most, the strongest parallels with the uh, Prometheus story and with the tragedy uh, are shown during the war episodes, when Vanya uh, meets Gavrilov at war. So Gavrilov, uh, the person, uh, also the soldier, uh, has a lot of revolutionary ideas, and before the battle, he directly addresses Pameshik, who is leading people to the battle, and other soldiers. So he says mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the generals, you are assholes, you are like maggots, but you are worse. Maggots eat dead bodies and you eat us alive. So this is the very important theme for the tragedy and story of Prometheus, the alive torture that is going, going on forever. And um, Gavrilov unwraps this idea uh, in the continuation of the speech. He tells the story about Prometheus, how Prometheus stole the fire and then was punished and tortured, and he says, strong eagle packs his heart, and ours, soldiers, peasant heart, crow packs, while with two heads plucked in our wars. So here, Gavrilov actually parodies the symbol of Russian Empire, which is a double-headed um, eagle, and for example, this is the caricature from contemporary to the events of the war, where uh, the split crowd in the Crimea, so this is uh, um, the symbol that exists in a cultural memory. So it's British, I think. Uh, um, for this terrible speech addressed to the general, Gavrilov is punished. So here there he is. It's very hard to watch the movie because of the quality. So this uh, punishment scene really reflects the one um, in the tragedy, because there is uh, there is Gavrilov. Here are the mountains of Caucasus, right? Uh, so the general Pameshik, he uh, 
he orders all soldiers to go through, uh, go near Gorilov and punch him in the face, each of them. So this is a punishment, very terrible. And he says, there will be no revolution in Russia. Um, so terrible punishment is going on. And then Vanya, the protagonist, the main character of the movie, uh, like Hermes in Greek tragedy, who is forced to participate in the torture, also participates in the torture of Gavrilov, um, Prometheus Gavrilov. So here is Vanya, here is Gavrilov, and that's the face Vanya approaches him. He has to kick him. And this scene really shows how the high power manipulates and uh, and makes people do bad and terrible things because uh, um, of its power. But the strength of Gavrilov really inspires uh, Vanya, and he comes to the village and he succeeds in overpowering um, the Pomeshik, bringing his ideas and light of this person uh, to his home. Uh, um, what happened with the film? It was strongly criticized by Stalin's censure. It was banned and never released in movie theaters. It was the part of ideological campaign against formalism in 1933, uh, sorry, in 1936, that was really harmful for many so Russian Soviet artists, scholars, um, and musicians. And one of the most famous case is the article in the new newspaper Pravda from 1936, two, two weeks before this one, against um, uh, Dmitry Shostakovich's uh, opera, uh, Lady Magnet in uh, of Mbsen, uh, district, and the, the most famous article, Mambo instead of music, that became the, the symbol of the <coughs> The same year, the uh, Moscow Art Studio, uh, Mo Moscow Art Theater Studio Two, directed by Smishlaev, the one who was um, the one who was producing Prometheus in 1925, was also closed uh, in this campaign, and Smishlaev unfortunately uh, died uh, this year too. Together with this, this movie. Uh, was criticized in the newspaper in the newspaper Pravda uh, in the article "Rough Scheme Instead of Historical Truth." So very similar to Shostakovich uh, one. Uh, so the actual reasons for, for uh, there, there are several actual reasons for uh, censure, and the first one is that film features rough naturalistic techniques in showing battle scenes, suffering of peasants, and there were a lot of brothel scenes there, uh, which went against aesthetics, uh, movie aesthetics at this time, for sure. And also, Cavalerizza was a very prominent sculptor, and he paid a lot of attention to bodies, to bodies and their positions, and much more attention than to words, actually. So the second reason is that Kavalaridze depicts Caucasian local ethnicities, Chechen, Dagestani, as being oppressed by the Russian Empire. And it was a lively reminder about the contemporary oppression and deportations of ethnic minorities in 1930s that were continued in 1940s. And finally, the film does not feature a great national leader figure like in other contemporary movies such as um, Chepaev of 1934 by the Vasily brothers and Peter Pierre, uh, Peter the Great of 1937 by Vladimir Petrov. These movies, they promoted and supported the personality cult of Stalin. But in this movie, the most powerful, powerful figure is represented uh, as lacking humanity, as completely evil, and suspiciously wearing big mustache and military, uh, and military form, military outfits all the time. So probably this was uh, the main uh, reason. There is no, this figure is uh, really represented very, very ugly in this movie, really ugly, believe me. Um, terrifying. Um, 
fortunately, this did not end uh, Cavallarese's career because he was very, very, very famous. Um, and they just did, couldn't kill him because he was really famous and his sculptures were, were everywhere um, and monumental sculptures. And uh, after this, he continues producing art and, um, and movies. But, um, and the image of Prometheus actually never let him go. And for example, uh, he created this galvanoplastics, meaning the um, a sculpture made with a particular, m particular metal work uh, in 1962. So he had a pretty long career uh, depicting uh, Prometheus and uh, the eagle, and now it's in Kiev, uh, in the museum. So um, here is kind of very convenient segue to my uh, third part of my lecture about 60s and 70s. After the war, uh, Promethean themes and in general classical themes were not very prominent in film uh, and theater, especially in film and television. I cannot think about uh, any good examples of this in 50s and early 60s uh, because of the social realism uh, and uh, other interests. But in 60s, it becomes more prominent in, uh, on the theater stage. More productions started to be made, um, uh, the adaptations of classical plays. And interestingly, the image of Prometheus start appearing in Soviet fundamental art in 60s and 70s. There are a lot of examples. I brought three. So this one called The Liberated Man, and you can see very clearly the Promethean themes here, the chains, and um, this is Yekaterin work. It was still there, so it's in modern photos. Uh, it was made in 1968, um, and this is a swimming pool. So it's the recreation center, um, and it's kind of Kind of swims. Um, so it's Ural. This one is my favorite. Whoa. Uh, it's Prometheus, 1974, in Burstyn, Ukraine, made in 1970, uh, um, and it's the um, electrical plant. So mm. there. It's just uh, amazing. Uh, and this one, again, they're all modern pictures, so they're all there. And this one in Taliati. Uh, made in 1976, the mural, and you know the modern Promethean people also contributed here uh, these days, and also representing uh, Prometheus. So together with art, Promethe Prometheus' image appeared in animation movies for children. Um, the legends and myth of ancient Greece were created from 1969. Um, to 1974 in Soyuzmult film, uh, the studio by Alexander Snezhkovlotska, and uh, the series included uh, the movies, the animation movies, kind of short-ish, they were they're all like 19, 18 minutes long, featuring uh, Greek famous heroes, Hercules, Heracles, um, Argonauts, Perseus, uh, Theseus, and then Prometheus. So Prometheus, uh, Prometheus appears in two, in two movies. The first one um, that that is called Return from Olympus, and it, it's about uh, the labors of Heracles and his struggle between should I go up and live with the gods, or should I stay on the earth? And the last thing that she do, that he does in the movie, in the movie, he is liberating Prometheus. And the second one is uh, dedicated to Prometheus' story, and it was the last. So they kind of uh, they kind of uh, make this kind of sorry the narrative frame um, of the whole series. And I have a feeling that they made this first because you know uh, Heracles is more tradition in more traditional hero. Um, it falls better with you know Perseus and Theseus and Argonauts, Jason, whatever. But then they saw the potential with the Promethean story, and then they made Prometheus 
The Lost. So I will focus on the Prometheus movie, but then go back to Return from Olympus in the end. So Prometheus movie does not follow the tragedy, it kind of unwraps um, the story of Prometheus linearly. So from the from Prometheus stealing the fire, then uh, go, the, go to Earth, and then to torture. So torture is actually shown here in the uh, children's cartoon. So first, first part of the, of the film, we see the Mount Olympus, where all gods live, and there is, uh, there is um, uh, the golden robot, <laughs> uh, a very interesting, um, uh, very interesting detail that does is not included in uh, *Grief Tragedy*. Um, it's, <laughs> it's guarding the fire because fire gives everything to God. It gives them their privilege. It gives them their ability to be warm, to know all arts and sciences, and live in comfort. Um, and then, on the Earth, we have humans suffering from cold, dark, and terror. Prometheus look, looks at the Earth, and he sees this, and he decides, I will help you. I will help them. And then, uh, following uh, the statement in the tragedy and the catalog of arts that actually present in, um, in the tragedy where all things Prometheus gave them actually listed, he comes to the earth and gives uh, people fire, so people become, create, become creators. So they, uh, they started uh, doing some things that actually make them closer to the gods. And of course, what happened? Gods became very, very angry about this because they should not, because with the fire, they will be just like gods, right? And um, they, the gods sending the evil eagle, Zeus's sidekick, which is particularly interesting character of the whole series and I would do another lecture just about the eagle uh, because um, as you saw from the beginning slides eagle is always present it's always together with uh, Prometheus and it's always give a lot of potential to interesting interpretations but here it's kind of the reference or reworking the uh, Disney strategies uh, because you know uh, the multiplication, the, the animation in Soviet Union tried to do something like Disney but different. So this actually series was um, kind of Disney instead of Disney. Uh, movies uh, for some people and I actually can say that a lot of generations remember these movies. My father who is who was who is born in 1960s remember these movies and I was born in 1989 and I remember these movies so these are going through generations to generations. I just yeah I just yesterday I talked with my family and I did a poll who remembers what and who which uh, what yeah everybody remembers. Uh, besides my cousin who's 14, she doesn't care. <laughs> so, um, a lot of potential, uh, and actually I found the article that why birds are the best uh, evil sidekicks in Disney movies. <laughs> so it actually uh, um, I think because they're, they look scary and ridiculous at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, evil eagle uh, follows uh, Prometheus and trying to destroy all fires uh, he gives to humans but uh, he's not succeeding and then Zeus sends the flood very scary this is very scary mm -hmm. this is Zeus sending the flood and flood destroys all <coughs> fire of course and uh, humans are suffering and then Prometheus takes the last fire that remains in his chest and gives it 
to humans. Now he loses his power, and now uh, gods can size him and punish him. So then goes then goes the scene of punishment. Here, technically, it fo it actually follows a tragedy, but um, and I think it's pretty brutal for uh, children's uh, cartoon. It follows the, tra uh, the, the tragedy, it follows the, the main story, but the personal altruism is really emphasized here. The eagle asks Prometheus, why did you do it? Did you, do, did you want power? Did you want glory? And Prometheus says, I just wanted to help people. How you cannot understand it. I just wanted to help. And this is, I just wanted to help people. It goes through the whole, uh, the whole movie, from the beginning to the end. And if it, in tragedy, the Prometheus um, really emphasizing his suffering, because it's a Greek tragedy, here Prometheus stands and loves. He just loves at the ego, loves at the gods, and very strongly uh, goes down in the abyss. Another important image that comes from Greek tragedy is image of fire. It occurs already in uh, the previous movie, uh, The Return from Olympus, 1969, where Heracles uh, releases Prometheus from his torture. And then Prometheus says, here is my fire in your chest. And Heracles feels this fire, and then we actually have some time, so I will show you the video. Uh, and then, uh, he goes to the earth because there are more monsters to fight. This is there are still monsters to fight uh, and with this fire that from the uh, treasury of the gods it becomes the symbol of humanity of altruism and kindness that now uh, the heroes possess this image uh, does not come from the vacuum this image actually has two very interesting roots so the first one is the cartoon that's called Legend of the Flaming Heart that was uh, aired, that was produced in 1967, so pretty, pretty uh, close to the to the uh, Prometheus uh, movies in uh, by Kiev No Film in Kiev, which is actually it's much shorter movie, it's around five uh, six second. It's based on Maxim Gorky's narrative of Legend of Danko short that was part of the short novel Old Woman Israel. 
Maxim Gorky is one of the most important Soviet writers who was the father of social realism and um, who was taught and studied in universities and high schools and schools until nowadays. Um, this is a part of his earlier work. It was written in 1894 and published in 1895. Uh, and it combines Moldavian and Romanian folklore with Promethean themes. The story goes that uh, people were, people stuck in dark woods. They had to get out. And it was scary and dangerous. And the young man, Danko, uh, offered to lead them out of the woods. But the road was terrible, and there was dark and storm, and people started to complain. And then Danko took his heart of his chest, and it burned like a fire. And eventually, he lighted the road, and humans came out of the woods and found a better place. But then Danko fell down on the ground and died. And somebody very careful stepped into the heart. Um, so this is uh, the story about Danko. And you can see how uh, the story told by uh, Gorky in the beginning of 20th century went through the whole um, development of Promethean image and combined together with the classical tragedy. Another influence, another interesting influence um, on Prometheus and kind of embodiment of this uh, ideas having the secret power in the chest is, of course, image of superhero. Because in this movie, Prometheus and Heracles, and you even can see, you know, the the kind of visual uh, parallels between He-Man, who, by the way, was was uh, created in also in 70s. So He-Man is a production of 70s too. A little bit later, it was like 1976. Uh, so you can see the similar states here. So both of them, Prometheus and uh, Hercules, uh, they possess uh, a lot of qualities of superheroes, superpower the fire in their hearts, mission. They have particular mission. They have resistance to death. They have ambiguous identity, especially Heracles, who is kind of half god and half mortal, and he doesn't know where to go, or eventually he does. Uh, he wants to go uh, and save the earth. And then they, like modern superheroes, Superman, Spider-Man, appear in the world at the time of uncertainty and doubt the time of chaos and disorder. If uh, the interpretation of Prometheus as a revolutionary uh, was mostly about the past, about the troubles and um, misfortunes of the past that became over, that the people overcome, that heroes overcome, and now um, uh, people are liberated that we saw in the uh, Moscow Art Theater production and we saw in um, Kavalaridze's movies. In 60s and 70s, the image of Prometheus is very different and it's more about the future uh, rather than past. And we can see it on all these uh, murals that are about um, uh, science and technological progress, and all of this Prometheus is uh, on the murals. They kind of they, they fly somewhere uh, in the space. And on the other hand, the people who created Prometheus uh, in the cartoons, uh, their time uh, showed them that on the one hand. Um, some of the misfortunes and terrible situations, terrible um, consequences of Stalin's rule, they are overcame. Some um, sorry, uh, <clears throat> and but still, they are living during the Brezhnev times and times of stagnation 
when, on the one hand, Stalin is dead and um, now it's better, but still the authoritarian rulers um, are still present and problems are not overcame. So I think that Prometheus here is not a symbol of liberation or revolution, or rather it reflects this anxiety about the present, and at the same time, it represents the hope for the future. So, thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about uh, the the Russian valence, if there is any, in in the word, the concept of Caucasian? This is such a loaded uh, word in uh, English. I'm just I probably used it incorrectly. Okay. The nations from Caucasus, from region of Caucasus. Mm -hmm. That what I meant. Okay, so, the, it, so does yes. that mean that there is no sort of overloaded? term like the English word oh, Caucasian? Uh, <laughs> there is, um, but the opposite. Oh, the, opposite. <laughs> the opposite, meaning that, meaning what? The racist. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Unfortunately, and I think this meaning developed in the 90s. So it's more recent uh, development, but I can be wrong. But there is, and it's the opposite. Gotcha. Okay. And I, I apologize. I used it probably incorrectly. I said uh, I meant the nations of Legion Caucasus, sure. meaning Chechen, Dagestani, and uh, other there are nations. So, but yeah, there is. Okay. Thanks. Everything is clear. So I'm interested that you identify uh, Ivan Kavalyutsa as a Ukrainian. Can you talk a little bit about his Georgian last name? Uh, huh? I was waiting for this question. <laughs> I guess why I was <laughs> um, it's not. Uh, his mother was uh, Georgian, but it's not that I identify him as Ukrainian. He himself uh, used very strongly the Ukrainian themes in his movies, the Ukrainian themes in his uh, in his art, and his uh, monumental sculptures, some of them are really huge. Like the, they're very, very, very big. They all, uh, they all are in the Ukrainian cities. So. So he's a Ukrainian, this is fascinating though, to think about. So yes. he is a per perfect example of, a, in some sense, um, so, sort of Soviet, but also sort of pro Ukraine. Kind of funny. Yes. Yeah, interesting way. Yes, yeah. yes. I'll throw out another one if there's time. Um, in, in an African context, Wale Soyinka was very interested in the idea of Prometheus as a uh, as a less personal figure, sort of a spirit that can infuse groups, and and I wonder whether in your thinking about these films, um, there's a suggestion that Prometheus can be the spirit of all of us, as opposed to the savior that we're waiting for. When he when he turns into a superhero, he feels much more like a savior we're waiting for, uh, the way that you've described it. Um, I didn't think about Suyinka. I referred. It's a little bit far afield from what you. I referred <laughs> to his work in in my written version of this, uh, because um, uh, his image of Prometheus and Dionysus, they you know all together appears in similar you know um, kind of in the same context in the same time. Sure. But I'm not prepared to answer this question now. Because I'm not really uh, eloquent in the same as work for now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back. You didn't add the most recent superhero would be Iron Man with the with the talk thing mm -hmm. and his heart. You know, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's another one. 
Um, I was actually going to ask um, what is the trend in post-Soviet use of uh, Prometheus? Is there a reaction against this kind of Promethean image, or is there another further change, as you saw from the early revolutionary to the um, late Soviet and then into the post-Soviet era? So just yesterday, <laughs> uh, I found um, there is no very good representation. Uh, there, there is no film or movie uh, between this and now called Prometheus, and I did not really research it. There is another series of cartoons uh, based on Greek myths uh, created in late 80s, early 90s, which are completely different, and these are cartoons for grown-ups. That is probably the project for another year for me, because nobody knows about them for some reason. Uh, but just yesterday, I found out that there is a cartoon made in 2017 called Kind Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And it's for children. It's a series, uh, a very short cartoons, like five minutes cartoons for children um, explaining, explaining the you know, world literature in five minutes. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple about uh, Greek myths. There are like three about Greek myths. And Prometheus, Prometheus is there, and the story, and it's very, very cute, very roundish animation, and it's called Kind Prometheus. And the story goes as it is that he stole the fire, and the gods punish him, but then he escaped, and then he, and then everybody has fire, and everybody now can uh, make sausages on over the fire. <laughs> so this is uh, this is the cartoon, and the story of Prometheus is told explaining the word altruism. So the narrative frame of this cartoon is two children talking about stuff and the about helping mom or something and uh, the world the, the word altruism came up and then uh, the story of Prometheus goes and it's 2017. So I didn't have time to show it to you it's just Adorable. It's <laughs> it's all round and like birds and like flowers everywhere. Even when Prometheus is chained to the mountains, there are like birds and flowers everywhere. <laughs> uh, but I since I found it yesterday, it's kind of the uh, the verb verb channel for children. So there are a lot of series. It's pretty um, a good quality. So I will look into this um, more because it's interesting. Uh, yeah, so there is this altruism uh, theme cultivated. I have another question. Uh, I, it's also about sort of um, the placement. So I know that, for instance, Colleen has done some work on Prometheus being Sicilian. Um, right, uh, or, uh, uh, and other people. Uh, uh, is there a move to put his his torture into the Caucasus Mountains, um, like like to literally place him in, like to move the mountain to a, a Russian or Soviet context? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, I think it it's important element that it happens, especially for Kavalerice, for example, who used the actual Caucasus and warrior Caucasus as the backdrop for the Promethean story. Um, the same as uh, we discussed this a uh, couple of last weeks, that the story of Argonauts is important and adopted a lot because Argonauts sailing to Georgia, which is part of the Soviet Union. Which, which makes sense with the Heracles too, sort of the yeah. extent of the known world yeah. at the time would have yeah. ended somewhere in Georgia. Yeah, so there is some geopolitics involved yeah. in this, in using this particular myth as well. And I take it back to the 1920s. So when you were talking about um, Stanislavski's um, rehearsals mm -hmm. of the of the term Promethean trilogy, um, you said it was kind of silly and it wasn't working. But if we think about Stanislavski and his, mm -hmm. the way that he re rehearsed things, it was not uncommon for things to never make it to a premiere. I mean, I'm thinking yeah. about Bulgakov uh, yeah. and the Moliere play that, that was in, had 440, yeah. I think, 
um, rehearsals was, yeah. and, and, and four performances. It was among many. So, there so, is a so list. to what extent is it the problem of the production, and to what extent is it, it maybe a member, I, I think we might have actually um, uh, a book from that uh, from that tour that Nervous Danchika was on here. Uh, we was beautiful representation of those troops with here with the special book in the library. But I, I think what if what if he had stayed home? and kept Stanislavski away from it, would it have come to fruition? Uh, I don't have an answer to this question. This is really interesting. What's the script Stanislavski like? was against this thing from the beginning. <laughs> so he according, has, according, yeah. so yeah. unfortunately, I did, I did not really do amazing scholarly work. I did not, I haven't seen the actual archives, mm -hmm. which are in Moscow, and for the logistical reasons. But I was pretty lucky that some historian of theater in 2016 wrote a very, very good work describing all the process using the um, using the uh, using the uh, archival all archives from uh, referring to this production. And apparently, Stanislavski didn't like it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was against Scriven's part, and he was against um, this mysticism that was there. But how it's different from other productions, I don't know. I know that other classical plays that uh, include the theme of revolution was, were very successful. For example, Lysistrata, that was uh, produced by Nemirovich Danchenko in 2000, oh, sorry, in 1925, was very successful. And it came to the U.S. Um, and here it was very successful. So other classical play with kind of idea with of revolution in the middle, it went very well. But Prometheus, I think it was you know the complex of factors. It was not just because Stanislavski didn't want it. It was many of them contributing, including the personal situation and in general situation with the. Mod one, mod two, all this um, inconsistencies between them. Question. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about Prometheus being a figure who appears in sort of times of uncertainty, mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you could come across anything, sort of examples of Prometheus from the early nineties, because you have the sort of seventies and you have now. Um, it's a good question. I did not. I did not look into early '90s, but um, there used to be. Um, it's a story for another day. Uh, there was a research institution called Prometheus that was working on the on the light designs and light machines from 60s. I did not mention it because just did not have a lot of time. And it, it uh, I think, existed until 90s and uh, contributed in the development of like rave movement oh. in <laughs> Russia. <laughs> and uh, actually this summer they presented the machines they were made in Moscow in the exhibition. So from revolution to rave. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, this may dovetail with your interest, but and this is not my area, it's Artemis Leontis at the University of Michigan. She uh, works on an American heiress called Eva Palmer Sikilianos, who commissioned a performance of Prometheus Bound at Delphi, which we have rather on Film this. Yeah. This seems to be something about the twenties. And for me, I did not mention this because I was focused in Russia, but I'm I'm aware about this. Mm -hmm. uh, this production, the whole story, uh, what was happening, and the the whole idea. Yeah. I, I I know about this. I considered it in my head, but I just left it away from uh, this talk for the reason of. Thank you for reminding mm -hmm. me. And I, I'm not meaning to align my former institution, but there is a little bit of a cult of Eva Palmer secured in Austin, Michigan, and I don't quite know why. Uh -huh. um, and the American school, there's someone working with 
two liberations in the Prometheus, right? Liberation from a domestic political overlord in the 30s, or liberation from cold and dark in science. And I'm wondering whether we're seeing a change in Soviet tolerance, or we're just seeing a difference in which parts of the story are emphasized. Because it seemed in the 30s they're emphasizing liberation from domestic tyrant, and in the 60s they're emphasizing liberation from cold and dark against foreign enemies, foreign monsters, which is, could have been a perfectly acceptable story in the 30s. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you think about that. And I'm wondering if, if this um, tension in the way this has evolved in, so in Russia is different from the way Prometheus has been portrayed elsewhere. Is this sort of unique interpretation of Prometheus in the Soviet Union, or is this, is this pretty common around the world? I would say, there's a two-part two, two Yes, two, two, two so, entirely yeah. different questions. <laughs> so the first one, I think, uh, and I can answer on both of them, it's similar and different at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I have one answer for everything. Similar and different at the same time, because I think the actually um, late 30s and late 60s, early 70s, they can be compared in terms of uh, the social, the change in social, um, in the situation that's going on there, from my experience. But the problems are different, and that's why the uh, uh, Prometheus gets different tasks in movies. Um, about elsewhere, I think uh, if we will look at the murals, the Soviet murals, where Prometheus is portrayed as flying, you know, in the future. I would say that, for example, in the U.S., the image of Prometheus like this happened earlier, from my experience. I don't know, maybe Tom can help me with this. What do you think? Do you think that the murals we had, the Prometheus, the metal Prometheus, the Prometheus flying in the U.S., I think this image was explored uh, more at the time of 30s rather than the 60s. Right, the, the, the Rockefeller Center yeah, for example, Prometheus was... The monumental Prometheus. Yeah, yeah. Um, but nobody ever portrayed him in cartoons, which was interesting choice for some material for children. However, I think that modern uh, Disney Pixar cartoons are actually more interested in Promethean figure. For example, Moana, the, the 2016 right, uh, movie, the main, one of the main characters is Prometheus. Right? The Maui completely uh, reflects Promethean story and I think it's emphasized. Uh, with a life torture and fire and everything, but here it's already a different story. It's a story about uh, ecological um, disaster and uh, what we do with what Prometheus gave us, right? It seems like there might be a unique link between um, the technological uh, uh, scientific Prometheus, um, as you say, the Prometheus against the dark with the altruism mm -hmm. that seems to be pretty unique to the, the situation you're describing in the Soviet film. That certainly wasn't Rockefeller's concern. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Let's all... Uh,